We're going to hear from another inspiring individual, and I am absolutely thrilled to introduce our 2017 commencement speaker, Frank Stifel. Frank has enjoyed a prolific career as a producer and director, and you can read all about his accomplishments in your program. Here are a few of the highlights of Frank Stifel's career. He has served on both the East and West Coast boards of the Association of Independent Commercial Producers. He is the only person to be elected twice to serve as the organization's national president. Stifel is also a two-time past chairman of the AICP show at the Museum of Modern Art, and in 2002, he merged Stifel and Company, the company he founded at the age of 19, with the international production company Radical Media. Stifel continued as executive producer and also produced a number of advertising sponsored television programs. And in 2009, Frank left Radical Media to direct a documentary based on his mother's life. Ingalore was honored by the International Documentary Association and the Museum of Modern Art. The film also appeared in 30 international film festivals and was acquired by HBO. In 2016, Frank completed a documentary named Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405. <laughs> That's some title, isn't it? This documentary is based on the life of artist Mindy Alper, and the documentary film premiered at the Broad Stage at the Santa Monica College Performing Arts Center and has gone on to a very successful festival run. And in April, Heaven is a Traffic Jam on the 405 became the only film to ever win both the Audience and Critics Prize at the prestigious Full Frame Documentary Festival. Frank has actively given Santa Monica College students, given to Santa Monica College students, and served on the uh, Santa Monica College Foundation Board from 1998 to 2016, and he was president for six years. And I mentioned uh, Heaven is a traffic jam on the 405, and I mentioned that the person that the film is about is Mindy Alper, and Mindy is with us today. So Mindy, would you please just stand where you are? <laughs> Mindy's amazing. Thank you for being here. Frank's wife is here too, BJ Stand. He brought his family, I love it. He's like the graduates, he brought his family, that's great. So Frank, would you please come forward and join me here at the podium and deliver your message and your words of wisdom to our students. Thank you. Dr. Jeffrey, Dr. Walzer, Mr. Snell, Dr. Amanoff, Dr. Greenstein, Dr. Jaffe, Dr. Quinones Perez, Mr. Rader, Mr. Matthews, faculty, staff, graduates, and guests. This year, Hillary Clinton gave the commencement speech at Wellesley College. Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, gave his speech at MIT. Oprah Winfrey double dipped at S Smith and Skidmore. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook spoke at Harvard. USC had both Will Ferrell and Deepak Chopra. And a bit later this week, UC San Diego will be addressed by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You, the 2017 graduating class of Santa Monica College, somehow got me. I have no idea what you did to deserve this, but it must have been bad. <laughs> when I was asked to do this, my assumption was that everyone on the globe that had ever done anything notable was busy tonight. 
But Dr. Jeffrey explained, no, you get who we are, and I do. I'm the son of deaf immigrants, people who came to this country and never heard the English language, and we were poor. I went to the City College of New York, which is the much uglier version of this place. <laughs> and I was an evening division student. The more relevant part of my biography is that I was on the Santa Monica College Foundation Board for 18 years. Last Saturday, the SMC Foundation handed out $700,000 in scholarships. We also fund grants of excellence to professors who want to push the boundaries of what's possible. We support the SMC Veterans Center, the Emeritus College. We send students who are interested in public policy to Washington, D.C. for the summer. And we support a host of other programs. The reason I joined, um, and certainly the reason I stayed for so long, is that I know that lives can be altered by opportunity. Opportunity sometimes has a price tag, and that price is inexpensive for some and impossibly expensive for others. The foundation provides that opportunity. There are thousands of success stories of people who might have been lost were it not for the support given by the foundation and its contributors many of whom are actually in this stadium right tonight. Please join me in thanking them for their support. Can I get a $700,000 thank you? Thank you. The, the often asked question, what are you going to do when you get out of school, assumes that you know every job that's available in the world, that you're never going to change your mind, and that you have much more control over your career than you actually do. For the next few minutes, I want to shift that question to an area where you can, that you can control. And I want to shift the question to, who are you going to be? So I noticed at the beginning of my career that if you graphed my professional life and my emotional life, it was the same line. Um, I was not a very complicated uh, being. Uh, if business were good, I was happy. If it wasn't good, I wasn't. I knew that was dangerous, uh, and I also knew I could never dial down the intensity that I had for work. So my plan was to add to my life to put things in my life that were going to be hard, things that I could learn, make my life bigger. And in the course of that, work would become a piece rather than a whole. Over the years, I became a husband and a father, an officer in a host of industry groups. I joined this foundation board. I was a basketball coach. I trained to run marathons and ride centuries. I took an art class. I taught night school. I shot a portrait series that took me five years. I made films. I learned to cook. And it was through all of those extracurriculars that had nothing to do with work that I actually shaped who I am. Here's how I learned to cook. It's important to note that by the time I was 30, I was completely phobic on the subject of cooking. This was, this was something that I was never, ever going to get. I would walk into a kitchen, my hands would go into my pockets, my eyes would get glassy, I would turn around and leave. It was as, uh, you know, recipes to me looked like very complex science experiments that were written in a foreign language, like, not a foreign language, Esperanto. Uh, and so, um, so one day I got tired of either being the guy that always washed every dish at every house because that was the contribution I could make. Or I got tired of this thing that was so big and so looming over me. And I invited people over, and I decided to make a meal. So it was going to be something easy. And it was pesto with, it was, a, uh, it was a pasta with pesto sauce. So this is not brain surgery for the uninitiated. You take a blender. You put basil, olive oil, pine nuts, Parmesan cheese, 
you push the button, you wait. <laughs> Two minutes later, you have pesto sauce. Now, the first thing I noticed was <laughs> I cooked with you. So the first thing I noticed was that instead of the predicted green color, it was black. <laughs> probably, the rest of, probably the result of too many basil leaves and too little olive oil. The next thing was that I noticed that this black viscous-like stuff was not at the bottom of the blender, it was sticking to the perimeter of it. And so what I did was I got a wooden spoon and I started shoving this stuff off of the blender sides, down toward the blades, and the next thing I noticed was that the blade had taken the last half inch of wood off the wooden spoon, which was now inside the thing becoming smaller and smaller. I served it anyway. <laughs> and I called it black pesto. Pesto Nero. If it's going to be bad, you've got to have some attitude. Pesto Nero. <laughs> the next meal was better, and eventually the food started to come out in its proper color without the taste of kitchen utensils. <laughs> and I began inviting larger and larger groups of friends to eat more and more complicated meals. A few years later, I ran the New York Marathon. There were 38,000 runners that day. About 40 of them thought they might win. The rest of us were out to prove something to ourselves. The first time I ran, I probably went about 20 minutes before I thought my lungs would explode. And had you told me on that day that I'd be running a 26-mile race, I'd say you were crazy. But here I was amongst thousands of strangers from 100 countries, and we were all trying to be that little engine that could. And as I looked at the runners around me, certainly the runners that were in the back with me, it was clear that these weren't natural athletes. But if you panned up and you looked at their faces, you knew that there was nothing that you could do to keep these people from running, to the, running through the finish line. And the amazing st statistic about marathons is when you look at the percentage of people that finish, that began the race, that number is in excess of 99%. Now, there is nothing remarkable about cooking a meal or running a race. What is life changing is when you find yourself doing the very thing you thought was impossible. The first time you shut down that demon voice that says, you can't do this, your life is different. You start to look at what else you've dismissed as impossible, and you become more comfortable in challenging those beliefs, and one day you find yourself with a voice that's clearer, standing a bit straighter, having a life you never thought you could have. Everything on that list of extracurriculars that I read a minute ago had some degree of fear attached to it. But once you're in the game of having the fear rather than the fear having you, the no I can't demon gets quieter and quieter, and every time you surprise yourself by doing the impossible, you're developing the yes I can muscle and making it stronger and stronger. The one thing that I know that you don't know is how much bigger your life can be how much bigger a game you can play. The way you shut down that monster that says you can't do something is by doing that something. It's not easy, it's not comfortable, it will humble you at the beginning. But there is nothing more freeing than knowing that you have the loudest voice in determining who you are. A month ago, BJ and I were flying back from a film festival where for the first time in its history, they gave the two top prizes to the same film. It was my film. And I was thinking about, <laughs> thank you. And I was, I was thinking about this strange turn that my life took. I made a choice at the age of 62 to leave the stability of a long and successful career to become a documentary director, a beginning documentary director. And I wondered where that decision came from. What, what was its genesis? Where, where were the earliest signs 
that this might work out. And I start to f started to flip the pages of my life back. And the answer, of, co of course, was a choice that I made half a lifetime ago. A moment where I saw myself differently, a moment that changed everything that followed. The answer for me was in the ugliest meal I ever served. The answer for me was that bowl of pesto nero. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Frank Stifel. I'd like now to invite Terrence Ware to present the commencement gift to our commencement speaker. Oh, there he is, Terrence. Thank you, Frank. This is just a small token of our appreciation for your being with us today and sharing your story. Your story of um, trial and your story of triumph. So on behalf of Santa Monica College, I thank uh, pres the student body president, Terrence Ware, for participating in the uh, awarding of the gift. Thank you, Terrence. <laughs> 